the nature of um, this uh, talk was theoretically about improvisation, um, which required us not to have to prepare. <laughs> Am I right? That's true. Right, which is why we embraced it wholeheartedly. Um, I think what we're going to do is we're just going to talk a little bit about, let me ask you a question by a show of hands. How many of you are interested in being in the entertainment business and are concerned about getting a job? Oh. Okay. <laughs> right. Yes, me that too. is absolutely true. Um, so we've both been doing this a long time. And even now with all those credits that were made up that we were involved with, we still... Um, every single time we finish a job, we're in a position of what next? How are we going to find that next job? What events are going to conspire in our lives to put us in a place where we will have the opportunity to work again? As opposed to being an accountant or you know other more traditional jobs, this is a job where um, you don't know what's around the corner. And sometimes that's fantastic and sometimes... Um, it's very uh, uh, frightening. So I want to talk a little bit about how you got to the point of being here, how you now have this esteemed career. At the beginning, your parents were in the entertainment business and bought you a studio, which is how you got your first job, correct? That was the first job, but then they lost everything. <laughs> you know. Now, my parents were, my, I, I'm from Wheaton, Illinois. So. Oh, thank you. Oh, we got some wheat and fruit. No, <laughs> no I, I don't think we do. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, it was, I was always interested in it, uh, but, but my, no, it's not, a, it's not a show business, certainly not a show business. You were uh, super family. funny in high school. Uh, yes, but, but not the class clown. Um, so you were in high school, you didn't know what you wanted to do like most of no, us. No, but I was interested in theater and all of that. And I did, I, I, in college I got in uh, doing some creative writing, got into an improvisational theater troupe, did plays in high school and uh -huh. all that. So I knew it was always, there was always a, a draw toward the entertainment industry. Usually, what, the way it first kind of manifested itself is as an actor wanting to be, wanting to be on camera. Because you were because I I, I admired you know the uh, all the performers that I grew up in. Your parents encouraged it. Uh, by encouragement, you meant no, they didn't. There was no <laughs> encouragement. No. Show of hands. No. How many of your parents are happy that you're interested in being in the entertainment business? How about how many aren't parents aren't happy? Yeah, about half and half. Yeah, but what are you going to do when you when you you know, bit by the bug, as they say. Right, what, you got bit by the bug. What are you going to do? I mean, you, it's kind of, you kind of keep going back. You, and in my, in my case, it's not, it's where I ended up, kind of, uh, which wasn't writing when I started. As I was saying, it was trying, when I went out to Los Angeles, it was, it was trying to be an actor and, and doing a few commercials. You thought and, that was the path? Yeah, I thought, but I knew, I knew, Fairly early on, that that I wasn't comfortable as comfortable with that, and so just to get you from high school to LA, then, hold on. So yes, you're in I high know. school, you're doing performance, you're thinking you're in an improv group in in, in school, college, and, and it, you have a friend who decides to go to Chicago. Am I right? Uh, well, he's from Wheaton as well. Yeah, right. But he decides to he come to he went to Second City and he got in Second City and he was in the, he was on the main stage uh, at Second City. And he says, "Dick, you he should said, come." He said, "You should come down and audition for Second City." And was was he particularly talented? You're a very leading. It, it, it was it was John Belushi who grew ah. up who I grew up with. I know what All he's right. going for. He <laughs> wants me to say his name. Okay, okay. Well, they're not going to say it. So no, who no, else is going to say, say it if you don't John, say it? John John was an old high school. I met him in high school, and we had a band together and all of that stuff. We did all of that. Okay. There's there's some we're selling them out in the lobby afterwards. <laughs> uh, but but he's he's the one who said come down and audition. Now, and I I didn't make the main stage, but I got in the touring company, and and that started my association. I always I always say it was John who really got things started for me because. Uh, it started the Second City connection, which which go, went throughout my entire career. Has been people that uh, that that working with Second City people and being recommended by Second City people. So John got me down there. I was in the touring company, and then eventually came out to Los Angeles. And it was I, I realized that I wasn't doing much as an actor, and and didn't really feel comfortable with it. So. 
uh, an old a friend uh, that was in Chicago at Second City as well, Paul Flaherty, and I decided to write a spec script together and see if we could do that. And it was a film script that we gave to Harold Ramis. This is how all of this works. And Harold, I knew from watching him on stage at Second City when I was in a touring company then. And uh, we had mutual friends, so I got to know him a little bit. But I, but af but I knew, because Harold was one of those guys that we all trusted his opinion and wanted his opinion. We gave that script to Harold, and Harold recommended us for the Second City, the SCTV job, which was the, does that, do people remember SCTV? It was a Canadian sketch comedy show that was on NBC back in the 80s, which started the careers of John Candy and Rick Moranis and Eugene Levy. And uh, Harold was on it the first season. Marty, Marty Short was, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it was that show Harold recommended when, when, when uh, we gave Harold our script, Harold recommended my writing partner, Paul and I, to write on staff uh, at SCTV. And that's kind of what started the my so the getting that first script to a place where somebody who could help you um, had it was not tactical. It was sort of happenstance, right? Yes. It was like this is part of the improvisational part of your our careers. It's like there's not like Dick didn't go to L.A. and it's like I'm going to go here and I'm going to do no, this and then I'm going to give the script. I'm going to. It was like you wrote the script and what now? What do we do with it? Which I'm sure a lot of you guys have experienced or will experience, and then. Well, somebody will say, you know, I have a friend who works so and so, and it seems so random. And like, well, how is that? But that's how it happens. It does. And I know it sounds cliche, but it really it does happen that way. Yeah, and so I've been doing. We started this school at um, Second City, the Harold Ramis Film School, um, and we've been bringing people in to talk. And one of my fascinations, even though I've been doing it for all these years, is even I think that. Paul Feig must have had some plan when he was, you know, when his career was evolving. But it was so random and so arbitrary. And every single person we've had in, um, the most successful people, writers and directors, it was, I was in a gym and a guy next to me was saying, hey, I'm doing this PA job, would you mind filling in? And then that PA job ends up leading to the job where he becomes a writer's assistant. It's yeah. just sort of fascinating, but... That's the one thing I like, and it's true. There is no, there's no two stories that are the same in terms of how people have made it in the industry. It's, it, there isn't a plan that you kind of can follow. I mean, you, you certainly can go to film school, you can go to the Harold's Conservatory, you can go through Second City, and that's certainly a great way to go. But I know, I know writers that went to Harvard, I know writers that never finished college. I, these are successful people that didn't go to college. That, everybody, literally everybody, has a different story of how they got to where they're going. But I guess the one thing they had in common is that that real desire and that real passion as writers, which we are, um, to be to be a writer and to start writing and to, like I did, just start writing a spec script and getting it to where you want to show people and get it to friends that, uh, or, can help or you. people, yeah, people that can help you that you've made connections with. Uh, and just get it going that way, you know, and that's that's kind of that's that's the one common thread is that uh, I'll speak as a writer because uh, th that's my profession. Uh, it's the it's everybody's done that. Everybody sat down and they wrote re they wrote things. They wrote either spec TV scripts or they've written screenplays, and they keep writing and writing and writing until they can get something noticed by someone and get somebody to read it. And, and that is the constant. How you get there, that, that's, that just happens. You know, it's uh, people that stick it out, people that really want it. Uh, some people move to LA, some people don't. Some people, a good friend of mine who wrote is still in New York and will not come to Los Angeles, but she's worked for Conan and she's worked for Jimmy Fallon and she's got a great career going in New York. And it, it doesn't have to, you don't have to follow the LA route if you don't want to. I, I mean, it is where most of production is done, so in that sense, it's not a bad idea. Am so, I getting ahead of myself? No, you're not getting ahead of yourself. You're a little behind, actually. Really? Yeah, I think we're... Um, <laughs> talk a little bit about... Um, so when, these, when, when people ask you to come and do these talks, it's always a little tricky because you don't quite 
we know what we know. We don't always know what people are interested in because I'm sure you guys have all different interests. The one thing I know is that everybody's interested in figuring out how to have a career. And so we were talking about, well, what should we talk about? Because we, we've done these before, and we sort of try and, you know, theoretically, we don't go on the road and do these, but when we're asked to do them, we have, we've done maybe one before together. It's like, what is, what is it that, about our careers that maybe we've learned that would be illuminating? And that's why we came up with this thought about it. we are um, improvising in our lives in a way that um, is not exactly the same as improvising in a movie, but it is not that dissimilar. Um, you think you know what you're gonna do when you graduate, but you really have no idea. And you think you know in a scene, when you have a comic actor and uh, pages that you've written, how it's gonna go, but it's gonna change. And part of the thing about the Second City ethos, um, about impro improvisation, is being open to um, the unexpected and, right. and not already knowing what's going to happen. And, and that's why we sort of tied this idea of living an improv improvisational life and improvisation in entertainment. So, um, and right now I'm just winging it, so that's improvisation well, as but well. You, but, but your situation is totally different. It's talking about how different people come get to Hollywood and how they yeah. get there. Is you, you come from a totally different background. From well, yeah, I did not grow up in Wheaton. <laughs> it's too bad. It's a nice little community. I grew up in Los Angeles, so um, but my parents did not have a studio. But um, I I went but your, to your dad was in the business. My father was a film producer when he was a young man and hated it so much that um, he did it for about ten years and then left and got into a totally different business. Um, but I was interested in um, comedy from a young age. Um, to deflect uh, uh, tension, I always found that making a joke always would help. When I would ditch school or get a bad grade, I, I always found that comedy was somehow a way to diffuse it and, and temporarily. Anyway, but I was sort of interested in comedy. I was a little bit of a class clown, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do. When I went to college, I studied journalism because I was interested in storytelling. Um, and it was a time in our country which is not dissimilar to what's going on now where there was a lot of divisiveness in the country. It was Watergate, and so I was interested in telling the stories that were going on because I felt that it was in important drama to get out. Anyway, I went to study journalism, and um, after about a year and a half, I was sort of getting, there's a lot of rigidity in journalism. I was getting a little tired of the who, what, where, and when. I wasn't doing, I wasn't, allowed to go out and do those big stories that I imagined. I was having to learn the sort of detail craft of it. And a friend of mine one day said, hey, I'm going to film my film class. Do you want to come with me? I had a break and I was like, film class? They teach film? And so I went to that film class and I, uh, I, I, it was, uh, the professor was so inspiring and the movie was so interesting to me um, was that it was, um, do you guys know who Jean-Luc Godard is, French director, new of wave director? they do, don't say Okay, that. I just want to make sure. Some of them may not be French here, I just don't know. And, and uh, it sort of blew my mind, and I, the next day I went and changed my major, and I studied, started studying film, and I graduated um, with a degree in communication and visual arts, but I immersed myself in European film, and, and I'd sort of lost my sense of humor a little bit, um, and I came to Los Angeles looking for a job. Um, uh, I was in San Diego at the time, and um, I was hoping to get a job doing something like being an assistant to a French European director or something. I, I thought that was what I should be doing. And uh, I, I did odd jobs for about six months, anything I could, working in restaurants and just to make money. And then uh, somebody sent me for an inter interview with um, Barbara Streisand, and I was hired as Barbara Streisand, the assistant to Barbara Streisand's poodle. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. <laughs> she, I mean, she needed an assistant to take care of her poodle, so I, I uh, it was and a cockapoo, to be story. honest that's with you, That's where you are today. Yeah, and that's how I got where I am today. <laughs> Uh, nice, very nice. And I had to improvise with that dog because that dog did not, we didn't, uh, anyway. Um, so from there, do you want to hear more of this? Yes. About the dog or which part? So we want okay. to hear about Streisand. Please Streisand. tell us about Streisand. Okay, fabulous. 
Um, who Raise your hand if you own a Barbra Streisand album. Oh, it's only three people. Four. Wow, <laughs> wow okay, excellent. Um, raise your hand if you know who Barbra Streisand is. <laughs> All right, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, when I started working for her, she was like um, uh, who, um, Taylor Swift. I mean, she was that big. It was like she was the biggest. And, it, and she was a movie star and whatever. And I was relegated to taking her dog to the thing and doing just the worst possible work you can imagine. But at least I could say I'm working kind of with Barbara Streisand. But I didn't want to be working with Barbara Streisand. I would want to be working with Godard or Truffaut or something. And I'm working with Barbara Streisand. And she had a boyfriend who um, was her hairdresser. And in the course of their relation, this isn't being taped, is it? No, it's streaming, though. But it's streaming. That, that, what does that mean? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, anyway, she had a boyfriend who wanted to be a film producer. He was a hairdresser. And she got him a deal as a film producer at about the time that I showed up. And so somehow, through improvisation and uh, my good fortune, he decided that I was too good to be taking care of the dog, and he wanted me to take care of his dog. <laughs> Not really. He wanted me to be his, am I digressing? No. <laughs> he wanted me to be his gopher in the office. And so I started working as his like guy, driving, doing crap, getting coffee, doing Xeroxing. And he was sort of aimless, didn't quite know how to produce, but the studio had invested money in her boyfriend, the producer, so they gave him a couple of scripts to make. Um, and one of those scripts was about a bunch of guys on a golf course in Florida, um, a comedy by a guy who'd written uh, one script, which was very successful, called Animal House, and that was this guy named Harold Ramis. And uh, the producer's name was John Peters, and he was given the job to produce this movie in Florida, and he sent me to Florida as his assistant. And on that, on that experience, was, Harold was the director, and he and I bonded, and... Um, I ended up being his assistant on that movie, and we worked together for 23 years after that. Could I have imagined that taking care of that dog would lead me to that? But it did. It did, yeah. And I have that dog, really, to thank for, for a lot, lot of what I did. And Harold was a graduate of Second City and um, taught me a ton about spontaneity, improvisation, and um, super talented, creative, incredibly collaborative guy. And he was so collaborative that I was the lowest guy in that movie, but he would always ask me, what do you think about what, this thing? What do you think about this scene? Um, will you read these pages? And I didn't really, it didn't note it till years later that this came from part of the teaching of Second City. You yes, want to talk a little was, bit about that? It much, was much more ensemble oriented. I don't know if anyone's taken courses there, or but but certainly in the old days, in those days when he was there, and, and what I found is that it is really taking care of not only your other actors on stage, because it is improvisational theater, but, but when you graduate from that, and, and working with, like on SCTV, which was, the cast was from Toronto Second City and Chicago Second City, and the writers, it was all collaborative. I mean, it was a great working relationship. It was, it was collaboration in giving ideas, it was collaboration in terms of being free to create and go down on the set and and but get, that was one of the, that is one of the foundations of Second City. Yes, right? very much. Can you so. talk just a little bit well, about it, that? Well, it is you know I always what I learned the most from Second City is first of all the idea Bernie Sollins who used to own Second City and was one of the founders. I, I saw I remember interviewing him for one of the DVDs we did for SCTV. And he was talking about how all the Second City graduates seem to, they listen to each other. They're listening to each, the fellow actors. They're, they're helping them on stage. And the people that graduate and become directors and become writers are, are, are so much in tune with the production. And, and what I really took out of it was the idea that you, you're not working for yourself. And I always teach this and I tell this in, in even when I've got a staff together like on Mad TV and hiring people is that you're not working for yourself. You're working for the show. And, and that's, that's where you concentrate on. You're working to make the actors look great. You're, you're not working necessarily for your checkbook, or, although as you keep working, obviously you, you're getting paid for things like that. But you're, you're, really, you're really putting yourself out for the show and for the good of the show. 
And unfortunately, like in all office, I think in all office situations, it always kind of, kind of deteriorates. De well, it doesn't deteriorate, but you always can tell the personalities that are doing it for themselves, that are doing it to get ahead of the others, that are trying to step over people, that are doing things behind the back, which throws off the entire, the entire. Uh, writing staff. So part of, of this culture of Second City, so the people that have come out of Second City, um, you know, Mike Nichols and Elaine May going way back, and then John Belushi and Gilda Radner, and then Tina Fey, Steve Carell, you guys know the second, I mean, it's like, why are all these people come out of this one little theater in um, Chicago? I mean, it's bizarre. And Toronto. And Toronto. It's, 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 there's got to be a reason and working with Harold, who came out of there, I, I think it was the ensemble. I think it was the ensemble because then, when you do get into the real world and you do get into shows, and I'm not repeating myself, but you do start realizing, oh, I get it. My job is to service the show. My job is to do anything. If there's an actor, you know, on Matt TV, we we did things a little differently than SNL did because on SNL, it really is every man for himself and woman. If you don't go up into the writers' room, if you don't have anything for the table read that week, you're not in the show. And uh, my maybe. It, because of the Second City and that we are writers and, and our job as writers is to service everybody in that cast. And, and, the, and like most casts, there were some, we had people in, on Mad TV that came from the Groundlings in Second City that liked to write their own stuff. There were, there were a couple of stand-ups that didn't write sketch very well. And there were a couple of actors that were really talented, but they had no interest in writing. And our job was to service those people and everybody for the show. And if we got to a Thursday night with a Monday table read coming up, and we didn't have anything for an actor, I would call everybody into a room and say, all right, we've got we've to come up with stuff and we've got to write at least one or two sketches where we have the actor that's not being covered is serviced in that. So, right. So talk about yes and. You guys, have you guys heard of this expression, yes and? Some of you have the Second City people, but I actually believe this is the foundational thing that makes that ensemble work. Uh, and I, it was, going back to the Harold thing, it's like, why is Harold so inclusive? Is he just like a saint, this guy? Yeah. Um, and it's so many people not denying, which is it's kind of the the rules for improv is that you never deny. You know, you always add to the scene. If somebody on stage gives you a piece of information, you don't deny it. You add to it. So and if I say, Dick, after this, let's go get a drink. Dick doesn't say, No, I don't think I, I want will a drink. In, when we get yeah. on stage. <laughs> oh, you're going to need one after this. <laughs> But, but no, I, you add to it. You say, well, I'll get it. You, know, you never even, say, no, we're not going to get a drink when you're on having this communication because that shuts down my idea. Yeah. So like Harold, when we were you know, on the set, it's like uh, anyone have any idea what, what could make this scene better? And if somebody said, well, I think a pizza, maybe you put a pizza on the table, Harold would never say, no, no, that's not a good idea. Oh, that's interesting. Let me think about that. Yeah. Um, and that would encourage this sort of a creative pool of ideas, and I watched him do it on um, with the crew, but he also would do it on the set. And now I'm sure with Harold, it was also. I mean, he took all of that, and yeah. then and then he digested out what, what, yes. and figured out what would work. But but he makes everyone feel like they're, they're included. Yeah, included in it, and, and and it does become a much greater creative atmosphere. I yeah, think. I mean, it's more collegial, um, and it makes you feel like it's okay to come up, throw out an idea. When I first uh, just uh, when I first went to Mad TV, I, I came in on season four, and there was there was real tension between the writers and producers up in one building and the stage, the actors and the director. And on SCTV, it was so there it, it was everyone was one working for the betterment of the show and all of that. So I I the one thing I tried to do as soon as I got there was to make sure the actors were going up into the writers' room that they were felt free to come in and pitch ideas that they felt free to sit in and improvise ideas if they want. I mean, if the writer wants to go off and write a first draft, which we did a lot with a lot of these improvisational actors on SCTV, I, there were some on SCTV, John Candy was hilarious, but he wasn't necessarily a writer that will sit down and write. Um, we would have, get him into the room, have him improvise, and we'd all write everything down. We'd go off and write the first draft for him, and then bring him back in, and we'd improvise some more things like that. So, so that that was a good way to use them. And what I did on Mad TV was get the actors and the writers together on the same page, and make the atmosphere free enough and creative enough where they felt free to come up and pitch whatever they wanted to pitch. And it worked well. It opened. It seemed to really open the doors 
to creativity in that sense because there were no walls, no barriers. You know, most sitcoms uh, are, are, those are done, that, it's the uh, uh, most sitcoms are done uh, as, a, they're writer shows, they're writer and producer shows when you watch a sitcom, unless you've got a star kind of heading the show like Roseanne or Ray Romano or any of those where the, it's their show so they're involved. But on sitcoms, the kind of the writers write the draft and you go and they, they hand it over to the actors. You go down each night to watch the actors perform it for you and, and then you go back up and rewrite. It's very much done like that. It's just, Is this a vibrating but on, stage? Uh, streaming, the streaming I had a bed once like this, but going. I never had a stage like this. <laughs> so in other words, what I'm saying yeah, yeah. Uh, is that... Um, Sitcoms are done differently because it is more writer-producer driven. Uh, sketch comedy, which a lot of mine is, and even something like Larry Sanders' show and certainly The Muppets and all that, are, are much more collaborative writers, actors, kind of collaborating a little bit more. Um, and I, that's, so my point on Mad TV is it was, I brought that Second City idea. Sensibility to Mad to TV. It because that's how I grew up on SCTV. I, when I first started, that's how we did it. So and I, that's all I thought. Well, that's, that's the only way that you can get the most out of people is if they, they really feel involved. In right. And that is, that is improvisation in that sense. The yes and. Certainly. Yes. Super important. What's the other Second City thing? What did I say? I don't know. <laughs> Does anyone hear that vibrating? They're, 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 they're laying asphalt. I just want to make sure it's not just me. <laughs> um, uh, so yes. the other thing about second, one of the Second City things um, is working at the top of your intelligence? Yes. Have you ever heard you. of that? Yes, I did. And that is what the other that one. What does that mean? That means to don't play down to the audience. I, uh, this is, uh, I also tell the writers and, and students that I, that I teach is that you never play down to the audience. When on Mad TV... I, I, not to bore you on that, but when, when the ratings were going great and we were beating SNL in teens and we were beating us, we were at least one and two with SNL in every market and, and our urban market audiences were huge and we were beating them in that sense. And we were doing it because I was doing what I, what I wanted to do, which was to, get, to have the writers writing what they want to write what we thought was funny, what was making us laugh. And obviously you keep in mind that you've got a big teenage audience and all of that, but you don't write down to the teenagers and not necessarily write to them. I always found that, that younger audiences like the idea that they don't get everything, like the idea that they're playing catch up. And, I, and when, I, uh, when Conan O'Brien, who was a big SCTV fan and always likes to talk about how SCTV influenced him and wanted to get into show business, he always said that he said, I didn't get every reference, but that I like that about that show because it was, it was playing catch up a little bit. And he thought, he really thought that was kind of cool. And because, because it was written intelligently, it was funny, it was accessible, but it was clever. There were left turns in our writing. And so I, I try to preach that kind of stuff in terms of that. What happened was some of our executive producers on the executive side thought, well, we've got teenagers, let's write down to them. Everything teenage. And that's exactly what the teenagers did not want because the stuff, if you're at the time, if you're doing Britney Spears jokes or Taylor Swift, they hear all of the stuff they hear in school. They like the stuff. They like to be surprised. Audiences love to be surprised and comedy is surprised. And, and they wanted you to stay a step or two ahead. Now, that's, that, I think that's true for any type of writing. Is you want to try to be work at the top of your intelligence, that doesn't mean you can't do broad comedy and you can't do uh, comedy that's, uh, that's not heady in any way or that. But, but you're working to the top of your intelligence and your comedy is at the top. And you can surprise the audience and stay a step ahead of them. Not give away everything at the beginning and, and not create characters that are one-dimensional, you know, really create interesting, deep characters while you're doing your work. And I think that's it. And they, that always taught me is, is don't settle. Write to the top of your intelligence as much as you possibly can. And the audience, I'm telling you, the audience, at Mad TV, all the emails we got were the scenes that surprised the kids, especially the kids that wrote in, that surprised them, that they didn't see coming. Those are the scenes. It wasn't the scatological or the, what they, the edgy scenes, which in Hollywood, edgy means that you say, 
you know, the F word every it's three words. But that's not what it is. The edgy stuff is dealing with things that people are uncomfortable to talk about or, or you're treading kind of new ground or you're saying something that's really original and you're being edgy in that way. Uh, there are great edgy comics out there. But, but when you do that, that's when you start hearing from the audience members and they say, you know what, this show is different, this guy is, this, this, this script is different, and, and that's, I think let, it does make Let me it. jump back and ask a question about going from knowing nothing to suddenly being a, in a position of responsibility, yes. which we all, this is part of the improvisational life. So when you got your first like serious job at SCTV, right, that was like, now they're paying me to write. Right. This is kind of a big deal. But I don't really quite know what I'm doing. Right. Do you have that experience? Yes. What is that? I mean, how, how do you wing it? I mean, how do you... You don't. You, you trust your instincts and you write things that make you laugh. And again, you, you, the competition, when, it, when shows are going really well and you're on a really good production, again, I'm speaking for my own person, you, you, you're, it's very competitive, but, but it's competitive in a good sense. You want to you, you wanna go to the table with something that's going to be as good as the guy. But you're nervous, you're right? You'd... Yes, you're very nervous. And you fail. Not, look, it's, it's, writing is failure. I mean, there are, there are sketches that I wrote that you think are going to gangbusters. Yeah. And it's you know death, you know crickets, everything. Right. Uh, so you you don't know, but you have to create. You have to trust that creative instinct of yours. Um, yeah, that's part of the journey. That I mean, I've had my whole career, and I still have it. And you know, the most esteemed directors, writers, actors. I don't think I've talked to any of them who, except the really idiots, who aren't nervous about oh, the next job. Always. I mean, you always. Um, are concerned. I, you know, I've produced a lot of movies, and I still am nervous about every project I Everything. go into. Like, do I know what I'm doing? Um, I'm telling you, when someone's reading your script, a script, and you get to know this, that's why. Sometimes when you're younger, everything is precious. Yeah. You don't want, and everything is funny, even though you're not hearing laughs, and you think it's all great, even though no one's laughing. Yeah. Uh, when you're in a when you're in a room and you're doing a table read with the network, and your script is bombing, you'll see the writers go down. And I mean, they know it immediately that this is not working. You know, even if it's a scene, even if it's writing and a scene kind of fails or something like that. You know it immediately, and it's either I gotta rewrite it, I gotta, I know what's going on. But it wrong happens it. at every point in our career. That's so, right, and, every, right. and so, everybody goes through it. So you guys who are all starting in your careers, some of you may have been doing it longer, it doesn't get better. I mean, you'll get paid for it, God willing, and, and oh, you will have success, but that experience of writing a script and thinking, I just yeah, don't know, I, it's, not, it's not good enough, it's never good enough. I mean, Harold, right to the end, um, who had incredible success was insecure about st continue no, to be insecure you just about gotta get it out there. And yeah, see. and the other thing is, um, I've 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 learned uh, it is really hard, and it isn't um, it isn't just about being um, creative and smart and funny, or if you're writing drama, you know, great storytelling. It is about doing it, which see, I'm sure you've heard this a million times. Any of you are in school, but. Um, there are a lot of people who I've met along the way, writers, directors, who are um, not incredibly talented, no more talented than anyone in this room. The difference is they are like incredibly dogged and they finish stuff and they just keep cranking it out. And for the writers in the room who are um, you know, insecure about your abilities, I would say the most important thing that you can do is to finish the script and go on to the next one and just keep writing because Hollywood is, there are a ton of people that we know in Hollywood who say they're writers and, oh, you know, so what, do you, I'm working on this thing. It's like, well, and then you realize they're not finishing stuff. Right. And there are a ton of writers in Hollywood who are very, very successful um, and not, like I say, that gifted but they just do it and they are dogged and that's all they do and they just keep writing and writing and writing. And that really is, I, I, I don't, it's not a secret, but it is the critical thing. Yeah. If you don't have the ability to get your scripts finished. Because you get better. You, you, yeah. you start feeling more confident the more you write. You Absolutely. Know? It's, just, so, it's doing it over and over and over again. It, it, you know, when I went on Matt TV, I, uh, you know, I was a showrunner, 
But then going down to editing and all of that uh -huh. stuff, and I didn't, I, I knew about it, and I did it a little bit on SCTV and a couple of other shows. But the more you do it, it's uh -huh. typical, it is the more you get comfortable with it, and then you finally, after, after a few years, you say, oh, now I get it. Now I know how to do this and this and this. The most difficult moment you've had in, um, in your writing career? The most difficult? You uh -huh. mean on the shows I've been Anything. Any comes to mind. Like, you know, the most painful sort of... It could be funny, too, but well, the thing that, that, that you're reminding of, like, uh, the difficulty. And then we well, the, the worst... I won't, I won't say You don't have to give names. No. But, the, but some, one of the sitcoms that I worked on, which... which it's not surprising. It only lasted 13 shows. It wasn't a show that I created, but although I was brought on at the beginning as a co-executive producer, and um, you could tell in the pilot that it was not. Uh, it was picked up as a series, but there were holes in the, the, the show and the characters at the very beginning. But um, they, the, uh, the head writers who wrote the show uh, were let go after the first episode, and they asked me to come in. But, but because the show conceptually wasn't that well thought out, the, every night was a total rewrite from the very beginning. We were there till three in the morning almost, uh, almost every night. I think we shot live, we shot on a Friday, and Thursday night we were still doing page one rewrites. Because so creatively it was a nightmare. It was a nightmare, it was a nightmare. And what's the best, your best professional experience besides well, this? Well, <laughs> there was, a, well, SCTV was great. I loved that. I, uh, the Muppets were terrific. Uh, I loved, it was still in the old days when the family still, Jim Henson had died. I, it was a few years after that. But his, uh, his son Brian was running it and still is. And, uh, and it was still owned. Disney hadn't bought the franchise yet. So it was still owned by the Hensons. And the old puppeteers were all still there, like Frank Oz, who went on with a great director, as Yoda, as you know, as the voice of. But he was, doing, he was doing Miss Piggy, so he was there. Did you do any voices? No, no, I'm not a puppeteer. Can you do a voice? No. Voice? Oh, come on. <laughs> no. Don't. Oh, just do one thing. The guys that us. do the things do all the voices. All right, but come on. Um, I'm doing Your this as if. The... <laughs> Your favorite Muppet? I, uh, uh, I that's I a know. ridiculous question. I, I, I know what kind people of want to hear these stories about. But Muppets. but they took it seriously. I remember being at a table read with Frank, and we were reading a scene. And after we read the scene with Kermit, he turned around and said, "I don't know." He said, "What's Kermit's want in this in this <laughs> sketch?" And that's that was going to be my first reaction. Uh -huh. And I stopped myself, thank God, because I realized he was right. He said he was treating it because they are real characters. And they've been, they're so well defined that he wanted to know what does he want in this scene. He was taking, he was doing a dramatic, he was, he was a, as, a, as he would a movie script, he was saying with real characters. And, and I, couldn't think, I couldn't give him the right answer. And I knew he was saying, you need to rewrite the scene, was what he was saying, because it wasn't. You didn't know what Kermit wanted. Good. Kermit wanted. I didn't, I didn't know what Kermit wanted. Yeah. But he was, but he was right to say it. And, I, and, and that's, I think, the success of that thing is those guys treat it that way. And, and you know, when, when people have Miss Piggy on Do the, hand the thing. thing yeah. And there's a little kid that walks up to them. Yeah. And, and there's puppeteers standing right like this. The kid, nobody's looking at, the, they never take their eyes off the puppet. In other words, it's a real, People truly believe real character to those kids. Wow. And the puppeteer is right there doing the, doing the voice. And, and they're looking straight at it. So, they, so my point is, yeah. you write for these characters and you treat them seriously even though they're, they are puppets. But the reason that thing has endured for so long is what characters they've become and, and how rich and they've written and been created. Did they drink off camera at all? A little the puppets, or yeah, the puppeteers? The, the puppeteers. No, no. What are you trying to? I this don't is know. Being, this is being streamed across the Chicago land area. <laughs> um, I think maybe some questions. Is this a good time? To, we, to, can we do that now? Well, we can. Is I this mean, making any sense at all? It's yeah, a little bit. Um, sure. Is this the time that we're supposed to ask uh, questions or no? Somebody's we can go asking on a that. Little. Um, maybe not. Do people have questions? Yeah. Well, you're supposed to get at a mic, I think, or, I or we can recreate, or we can re repeat. All right, the who question. has a question? All right, just yell it out. Actually, do we need you to go to the mic? I'm sorry. Oh, can you go to the microphones? Uh, there's, oh, there's a mic on this side over here. Right there. Oh yeah, nicely lit. Wow. 
Hi. It's something else. Um, so I have a question. Um, earlier you were talking about reading your scene and it bombing. Uh, yes. And I guess this is a bigger question about like how many people do you get notes from and like how big of a testing audience do you um, try to go to before you're like, okay, this is wrong and I shouldn't trust my instinct to, you know, like I, I need to rewrite this. Cause I feel like often as young writers, you, you know, we give our things to people to read and then we take all of their notes and then it just stops being. Well, what that's you what you have to, you, that's, that's, that comes down to like Trevor was talking about what Harold would do and what I would do. You have, and any writer would do, you have to take, if, if you are giving, give it, give your script to somebody you can trust that, that you really trust will give you an honest response with, to. And, and then you kind of do take it back and see if you can make the notes. I mean, I've been in a lot of note sessions where you go back to the writer's room and you try to make it work. I, I was always respectful of notes, but if it didn't work in the script, I wouldn't use it. And I, I got a, a couple of executives angry that you didn't use the notes. And, and you have to explain it, it, it didn't work. I mean, it didn't work within what we were trying to, to rewrite. So you have to be, I, I always, I know writers and I've done it, but I know writers that still will come into note sessions without their script and without a pencil, and you're saying, you, you know, and, the, and these are just note sessions with myself or the head writer or something like that, because the writers are very protective of their stuff anyway, and I get that. Um, but, but you, you know, if you're working for the production and you're working for the show, as I was saying earlier, and you're servicing the show, you've got to, you, as a staff writer, you've got to treat the note session with respect in the sense that we're all trying to make it better. Now, if you go back and say, I couldn't make that note work, that's a different thing. I, I, you, you're still trusting your instincts. I mean, when something doesn't work, that doesn't mean you, you, you know. But if someone's paying you, yeah, well, and they you say, would, you know, I think it should be a pizza. I wouldn't show up with a burrito. Well, I think you know what would happen if, if you, yes, if 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 you're in a meeting, you know, and your your executive producer and head writer, and you're sitting in there, and they're giving you notes, and you're taking them down, and then you come back with a rewrite that doesn't have their stuff in it, um, without saying anything, they'll they'll mention. I mean, they may not go crazy, but they'll say, "What happened?" I mean, that was we were all laughing at that joke. And why why isn't it in there? We did a we did a whole thing in the office and that. I mean they they you do have to respect it that way and and put that in. Now in terms of testing, you probably I mean uh, sketch comedy doesn't do any audience testing. Thank God. I mean I, I know sitcoms do. They'll do the 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 test audiences and all of that. But thankfully, sketch comedy because it's short form and and there's so much that change from week to week to week and there's not set characters necessarily from week to week. Um, uh, we never tested any of that stuff. Um, but you with films have done, I'm sure, taken notes. Well, notes from studios on your scripts. So. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's like if you give a script to a friend and they give you feedback is like they did not get it. That happens sometimes. It's like they just don't get it. That's one thing. And then you have to develop a relationship theoretically with the person reading it or the studio or whatever it is where you think, I actually trust this person. They're actually going to make my script better. I hate to hear that they don't love it, that it's not perfect, but they probably, because my experience with them is what they're saying, I can sort of understand and they may be right. It's worth trying quite often. Um, the, the instinct to shut people down. This is the yes and thing. It's like people give you a note and say, you know, try it with a pizza instead of a burrito. No, no. It's, I encourage people to, yeah, well, let me try it, you know, unless it's so wildly off. But, you know, if you're working But I think you'll know if it's wild. Yeah, yeah. I will. think your instinct will tell if if the note is so off base and like you said they just didn't get it, then you just, you know, you go back and you you, you can't make it work. Yeah. Uh, you should something if the notes are good or if the person is good giving the notes, you'll it'll it'll spark you'll know. something where yeah. you say, "You know what? That's not a bad idea. Maybe maybe there is a way to make that work." But and, send whatever you have to Dick and he'll he'll <laughs> get back. Okay, I will. Does that answer? Yes, thank you. Thank you. It, it, is, it is so instinctual. It's tough to, um, to, to know because you, when you write something, you're with it for such a long time. And that's why when I gave our first script 
to Harold to yeah. read. We res I respected Harold, and I gave it to somebody who we that I really respected comedically, and so I knew if he didn't like it, then then I would have been worried. But I but yeah. I, I I trusted the sensibility would be the same, and that he likes at least some of it. Anyway, hello, I to to hi. Um, I have a question as a writer and producer. Did you have a mentor or someone you looked up to? If so. How did that help you significantly in your um, mm -hmm. career? Mm -hmm. uh, well, my mentor was this guy I met through the taking care of the Barbara Streisand's dog, Harold Ramis, who, um, and um, he was, uh, I don't know, 10 years older than I was, but you know, he was the most important movie person on that movie set. Um, but I respected him very quickly. I thought this, I like similar sensibility. I sort of, um, I, I wanted to learn from him. You know, you meet people who you like, I don't want to hear another word out of this person's mouth. And then sometimes you meet people and it's like, yeah, I want to hear more. I, I'm really interested. And the other thing he had was he wanted to hear what I had to say. So it's, you know, sometimes you'll find mentors who are very good at talking but not good at listening. It was important for me that I had somebody who was also interested in what I had to say. Super important. They didn't have such a big ego that it was all about them. Um, so, yeah, he was, for me, like a super important person. And the, probably the most important thing he did besides sort of taught me, I don't know if I would have had the same spirit of inclusion and like listening to everybody on the set and being very collaborative. But he also, um, I was 22 and um, I hadn't read as much as he had and I hadn't seen as many movies. And he was like... Um, have you read this Mark Twain short story? No, I haven't. He'd tell me, go read this. And um, movies, he'd say, have you seen Sullivan's Travels by Preston? No, I haven't. And so I'd go see it. So his mentoring wasn't just giving me advice, listening to my ideas, but also, you know, almost like a teacher. He was, but in a very casual way. Hey, look at this, look at this, look at this. My joke is that he was, um, that I was the first graduate of the Harold Ramis Film School because all those years ago, you know, 25 years before we started this school, he was basically educating me about comedy. And so he was a fantastic mentor. And like I say, most important thing, he was a really nice, kind, caring guy. So, do you have a mentor? Before? Well, Harold, uh, differently, but, he, but as well. No, one, no, no, he was my. Oh, was that yours? <laughs> You can't take my mentor. Um, <laughs> did I mention John Peters? <laughs> Barbara Streisand's dog, however, was influential. Um, Harold, Joe Flaherty, who was uh, the senior member of the SCTV cast. He was uh, your mentor? Well, I used to, see, I okay. used to, I used to uh, watch him on stage. He was a little like Harold in that you wanted to make Joe like it. Yeah. And the same as Harold. What you about know, John? If John who? Belushi. Belushi. No, I've got like 12 mentors. You've got too many mentors. No, John was. And, and when I started, when I worked for Tracy Ellman and I worked for James L. Brooks, who uh, executive producer of The Simpsons and did it as, as good as it gets and whatever, uh, how many else. Uh, I, as a writer, uh, because he's a writer, I, I learned a lot from him because he was... He, he wanted writers to do research on a subject. If you're working on a sitcom form, he, you know, you research those characters, you interview people. I did a tennis show for him back in the day, and we did a pilot, and put, it was on ABC for about a year. But, but it was all the research we did, and, and, and he was right. And, and the, the, the actual art of writing, he taught me a lot in terms of that dedication and going, leaving no stone unturned. And, and if you're doing a subject matter that's uh, about something that's out there, you research it and you talk to people. This was about a tennis player. We talked to Jim so Brooks, you mean? Jim Brooks, yeah. yeah. You know, he was he was great. He I learned I learned a lot from him in terms of in terms of, of being a writer. It, are it was are a, you do you have a mentor or are you sort of thinking how do I find one? Yeah, I'm thinking how do I find one because I'm a uh, writer. Call Dick. Well, I've got, I'm reading this guy's their scripts. No, yeah, that's right. You should. Well, that's the idea of the, you know the Herald Film School, which I, I teach at that that Trevor's involved in. There, there, there are a lot of students that now are contacting me and 
um, after they graduate, and with you as well. Yeah. And and I and I meet with them, and and uh, Trevor meets with them, and they'll send me the scripts or their short films, all of that stuff. I, we're happy to do that kind of stuff, and that's 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 getting involved in the community. And you know, the other thing is coming out to Los Angeles because I know Los Angeles. When you do come out, there's a whole community. If you're in if you're into comedy. For instance, and you can stay with Dick when you're there. Am I well, right? Yes, but I'm being a mentor to her. Yeah, right. <laughs> but but there's a whole community of, of of people your age that are out there, and that's what you do. You get involved in that whole kind of comedy community. If you're at UCB or hanging out at at Second City and different improv. Companies. But I think part of it is um, inadvertent. You know, I didn't know that I was going to meet Harold, and you didn't know how that was going to happen. So. You can't exactly like make a list of I want, but in a way you can because if your interest is comedy or drama or whatever it is, you can sort of make a list of these are people that I really admire, um, and you'd be surprised. You know, I, you don't want to write creepy fan letters, but an, a bunch of our students from the Harold Ramis Film School have pursued people they were interested in their work and ended up working with them or becoming friendly with them because people. Um, who are talented and in, in, in the creative um, arts, they love it when young people are interested in their work and admire it. It's not like, you know, it's not like fans. It's like people, if you're a writer and are interested in other writers, writers like getting a letter from you saying, I love your work. Would it be possible to have a cup of coffee with you at some point? It's not out of the question to do that. So I would encourage all of you to, you know, figure out who those people are you really admire especially writers, and send them letters. I mean, they, they, um, they respond to that. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to give your address out, Dick, now or afterwards? No, I'll do it after. Later? Um, last question. What does that mean? Yes, yeah, so we have one more question. <laughs> okay. Um, one of my challenges with finishing uh, my work is just feeling like it's going to have legs. And I have one potential thread that may go somewhere, but it may not. And so how important is it to try to, I don't know, even produce content? This is something I've read. Maybe it's bad advice because I don't have talent for producing content like web series or something like that. Um, I think the advice I'm hearing here is get in touch with writers and even people you don't know. I guess I didn't realize that was something that would be re responded to well. So it's great to hear that. Well, producing, and you could talk about this, but even for web content is getting your friends who has the camera and getting the people that you know that uh, that'll come out with you and help you, you know, create it and get it done. I mean, yeah. But just specifically, what are you thinking of? Like, are you? Uh, uh, do you have an idea that you yeah. want to get made? Yes, and I'd rather not be the one to make it, but if you it's what? The, I'd rather not be the one to make it, but if it's the only way to get it made. Is this so, for is this for the web or for uh I uh, no, I'd like it to be, you know, a film and it's, it's have you written a it? comedy, uh, kind of part way. Is it okay. way. Is this, part, go ahead. No, you go. The script. Do you have it in script form? Yeah, it's part uh, way. It's been in book form and what I've been thinking is I want to kind of transition it out into it's it's when you talk about it living with you, it lives with me, and so I want. Is it to a drama on. or a comedy? What genre? It's is it? a comedy. Okay, well then I would enroll in the Harold Ramis Film School. <laughs> Am I right? And You're then you absolutely right. then you would be able to finish your screenplay, and you would get some <laughs> mentors, and what else? And you'd get equipment. Or, or um, no, I'm kidding. Well, maybe I'm not. Um, I think what Dick said about. Well, first of all, if it's a, if you have an idea of writing a, a, a full length or getting a full length screenplay written, the idea of doing it without, and I'm not promoting DePaul or the film school or anything else, but without the education mm -hmm. to like, you know, I think you, it's important to take screenwriting classes. Maybe you have, um, you can take classes and you can still not finish a screenplay. That's a whole different thing. Mm -hmm. But I think part of the impediment for people who want to write stories, even if they've written novels but haven't written screenplays is it's a whole it's writing a screenplay is almost mathematical it's a whole different set of muscles that you have to use so i would encourage you to take a class or classes if you have you taken classes not in that oh yeah definitely i mean that would be the first thing i would say is um harold ramus film school dot com <laughs> kidding um, no take a class a, a local community class on depaul may have uh, extension classes and just take a screenwriting class. It will make a huge amount of difference, I think, in your ability to finish it. So. Do you have a desire to write it yourself? 
Oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. It's all mapped out. Oh, it's just well, well, yeah. Take it. Okay. Dick, do you have any different advice? The Herald, no. The Herald Ramis Film School. <laughs> <laughs> no, get it. Somebody, do you have a writing partner? You know, I wrote with a writing partner for a long time. It's important that you get somebody that it doesn't necessarily have to be the same sensibility on everything, but, but somebody that you really connect with and that you can write with. I mean, that's always, uh, if you can find a partner, that it's always nothing wrong with that. Any, raise your hands here if you'd like to comment. partner with this young lady on this screenplay. <laughs> I'm kidding. No. There was somebody there. Was no. Somebody raised their hand? All right. All right, one more question. One more question. Do we have time for one more question? No? He said no, but this is improv. Somebody yell yes? out a question. Did you say yes? Yes? No. I don't think we have any more no. questions. All right. Either. Well, um, I think... Oh, yeah, go. What? Okay, we're done. It's anarchy. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. If you have any questions, Dick lives in Los Angeles. His address is 1632 Crescent Street. Am I right? Crescent Heights Street. Crescent Heights. <laughs> do it right if you're going to do Thank it. Thank you all for coming, and good luck to you.